means go into strict training. Tell your neighbor, strict training. Remember that word. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Say amen. amen. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Amen. amen. If you have your Bible still, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily betangled us, and let us run with endurance. Tell your neighbor, endurance. The race or the mark out for us. Let's continue on. Just Ephesians 4.22 says, that you put off concerning the former conduct. Can you say amen? amen? I really love what Paul has to say about a runner. <laughs> he is comparing, first of all, I want to say Paul loved sport. Because when he's in his letters, when you read it, uh, he talks about boxing. <laughs> he talks about wrestling. Slam that man down. <laughs> he talks about running. And he talks about fighting. When you read his letters, he's very expressive. Uh, he also talks about putting on your whole armor. He talks about being a soldier as well. I love this man. This man touches me every time I read about him. But in this portion of the word, he is comparing a Christian life to a runner. And in this running event, it's like a marathon. I'm very visual, so you bear with me, okay? It's like a marathon. In this marathon that he's trying to compare us to, there is no shortcuts in this marathon. Every Christian that receives the Lord as their personal Savior runs in this race. That is the privilege of running in the race. In the normal world, only one gets the price. But in God's world, when we make it to the end, we all get the price. Can you say amen? <laughs> we all get the price at the end. But we have to be focused, and we'll get to that. But he's saying, this is a marathon. We all run in the race when we are Christians. There is, um, We need to be focused in the Lord. It's a Christian walk with the Lord. It's a Christian run. He's saying here, there's no shortcuts and no substitutes. Uh, no one can run the race for you. You have to run the race yourself. Uh, he has called you. He has picked you. He's ordained you. And he has written your name down in the book of life so you can run this race yourself. And uh, another thing about this race, uh, you don't run it yourself. Uh, but another thing also is uh, there's lanes. Uh, how many of you have seen the Olympic runners? Uh, I love to see that uh, because I love learned a lot from them when I when I see TV. When I see an Olympic runner and I see their bodies, I see muscles everywhere in their legs. I see muscles in their arms. These people have trained so hard to get to the place of being in the Olympics. They didn't just say, I'm going to go and run. They didn't say, I'm just going to go and sign up on the Olympics. They had to go through a process. We as Christians, the you that are starting off this ministry, I want you to get this message in your heart. May it burn in your heart because a lot of people are going to be coming in here and you have to be mentors. You have to train them. You have to teach them. You have to mold them. You have to counsel them. You have to give them godly advice. But for you today, I want to tell you, what is the first thing that a runner does? When I see the Olympics, I see the runner running with the right equipment. She has the right shoes. Uh, she has the right clothing. Uh, she does not run with uh, boots. Uh, she does not run with a backpack. Uh, she doesn't run with a heavy load. Uh, she runs uh, as swift, uh, as little as possible. They have cute little outfits. Uh, I love fashion. <laughs> they have really colorful, cute outfits. Uh, but also, she has the right equipment. Uh, another thing, uh, they have short hair. If it's a female, she has her hair up. Uh, she doesn't want anything to interfere 
with her race. Uh, she wants to be focused. She wants to know where she's going. If it's a man, uh, he has short hair and he's ready and equipped. Uh, so the first thing is having the right equipment. Uh, the second thing is having a nutrition program. Oh, I tell you, they eat the right food, take the right vitamins. They're constantly drinking water. If you're a runner, uh, you know what I'm talking about. I was a runner because I have long legs. I went move and I move really fast. Uh, my husband has little short legs. Uh, if you know Pastor Lemons, when we go around the block, I want to work out. Uh, but with his little legs and my long legs, uh, I quite don't get the workout. He does because uh, he says, you walk too fast. Uh, he's catching up with me and his heart is going and my heart is barely going. <laughs> But we have to be in this nutrition program. A runner is very careful in what they're eating. We as Christians sometimes want to eat everything that is so corrupted, so polluted. It chokes our spiritual life. We spend time praying for hours. We spend time crying out to the Lord to clean us up. We spend time saying, Lord, I want to be more like you. I want to reflect you. I want to do great and mighty things for you. But at the same time, many of us are eating the wrong things. We need to be focused in our spiritual life. Uh, we need to read the, the word of God, eat the word of God, chew the word of God. Amen. That is your vitamin. That is your strength. Uh, that is your power. That is your, uh, your victories. Uh, if you want to see the Lord move in your life, read the word of God. Amen. Chew on it. Uh, let it be your daily vitamin. Let it be your strength. Uh, let it shake you. Let it mold you. Let it come to the point where you feel the fire of God's presence. Like Nehemiah says, I feel the power and the fire in my bones. Uh, let us come to that point uh, where we can too say I feel the anointing of God moving every time I read the word of God. Every time I read the word of God, it moves me. Every time I read the word of God, it shakes me. Every time I read the word of God, I'm not the same. Something comes over me when I start reading the word of God. And then another thing about uh, a nutrition program, we need to learn to pray. We need to just get into prayer. We need to just so in prayer. We need to come into the presence of the Lord. Say, Lord, I need you today. I need you to walk with me at work today. I need your help. If you're a teacher, you really need the help of God. If you're a nurse, you really need the help of God. So when you lay your hands on your patients, Lord, heal them, heal them, heal them. There's something about prayer. Prayer moves the hand of God. We need to be so nutritioned in the word of God and in prayer. And there's another thing that uh, just encourages my heart as a nutrition meal and that's worship. I love to worship the Lord. Worship just gets me so on fire. Worship just does something to me. I might come into the presence of God weak and worn and torn throughout the day but when I soak in the presence of the Lord hearing music, there's something about music. It just smooths me. It removes all the ugly stuff uh, that try to stick on me throughout the day. Prayer and reading the word and worship that is our nutrition program. You want to grow in the Lord? Get in those three areas. You want to be powerful for the Lord? Get in those three areas. You want to see signs and wonders? Get in those three areas. Get involved in this nutrition program and I tell you there's going to be so much favor over your life uh, that God's not going to help it but to pour blessings on you and to increase that anointing upon you that it's going to move you it's going to stir you it's going to bless you and you're not going to be the same we all need that nutrition program another thing that we need uh, we need to be in this training program oh every runner is in an intense training program they want to get in shape uh, they want to get stronger they have a workout schedule they have to learn the do's and the don'ts uh, and they want to meet their training goals uh, we as Christians uh, we need we need that too. We need to make time to read. We need to make time to pray. We need to make time to soak in the presence of the Lord. We need to make time to do that. When we're in the presence of the Lord, he corrects us. I would rather be corrected by the Lord than by my brother and sister. Oh, that's for sure. I'm sorry, brother. Do you have any water? Do you have any water? I would rather be corrected by the Lord. <laughs> you know why? Because the Lord is just so gentle, so precious, so kind. Thank you, Jesus. And then when he speaks to me, it's daughter. 
when he speaks to you, it's son. When he speaks to you, he grabs your heart and you're attentive. When he speaks to you, he says, Martha, don't do that anymore. The do's and the don'ts are if you missed what he wanted you to do because of fear that gripped your heart, he had given you a message to give to the brother and you didn't do it. And that message could have made that decision so clear because he was praying for that message. He was saying, God, I need you to speak to me. I don't know what to do. I need you to guide me. I need you to be the great counselor of my life. I need you to just move on me. I've been praying. I've been reading your word. I've been soaking in your presence. But I need you to move on me. And the sister had the message. But she neglected because of fear to tell the brother. And when the Lord has a talk with you and says, son, daughter, he never gives up on us. He will prepare you more with more boldness and with more courage to do it right. I would rather have the Lord teach me the do's and don'ts because I learn faster when it's from the Lord because I don't want to break his heart. I don't want to discourage the Lord. I want to do my best to please the King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to do the best to serve him the way he wants me to serve him. Every runner has a a training program, and so do we as Christians. Every runner is disciplined. Self-control is very important to them. They're very committed. And not only are they committed, they're hard workers. Discipline is part of our, it's part of our lifestyle. As Christians, as a runner for the kingdom of God, we need discipline. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's a lot of things out there that it looks good, looks pretty, looks strong, looks healthy. But that's not, uh, it's not real stuff. Uh, It's just glittery on the outside, uh, but it's dangerous in the inside. Uh, We just need to be self-controlled. When the world says do this, we say no. When the world says uh, if this is a pleasure, you're missing out. uh, And we say no, because we are desiring to please the Lord. Our hearts cry for the Lord. Our message is to please the Lord. Our example is to live for the Lord. We have a testimony overnight I don't want to ruin my testimony it happens Uh, men and women uh, have been great uh, pillars for the kingdom of God and overnight they have lost something because they failed uh, and they they lost the control we as the body of Christ as runners uh, let's hold on to being self-controlled it's one of the fruit of the spirit uh, and only the Holy Spirit uh, can teach us to be self-controlled tell your neighbor let's be self-controlled another thing about a runner oh speed is very important to them how many of you know that speed is very important in a race every step is critical to the runner not only the the step but every second is important to the runner the runner has a purpose and that's to win the runner has a purpose and that's to get the medal the runner has a purpose and that is to finish uh, the race we as Christians too we have to walk and learn how to walk in God's timing. A lot of times we're praying for things and the Lord says, not yet, son. Wait a minute. Not yet. Right now is not the time. 
time. We as Christians need to be well-rounded and well-disciplined. When God says no, it's no. When God says wait, it's wait. When God says yes, it's yes. When God says don't move yet, don't move. When he says move, you move. Let's move in God's timing. Do you remember just like the Israelites, they had to learn. Remember the cloud was protecting the Israelites. When the cloud moved, they moved. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. God has not changed. We need to go in God's timing. We need to walk with God. Too many Christians, too many runners are running before God and they're missing it all. They're running alone. They're not running with the Savior. They're not running with the signs and wonders. They're running dried because the Savior said no. And then they have to come back and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. They come back all defeated, all drained, all in chaos. And Lord, I am so sorry I got out of your timing. How many of you met people like that? They got ahead of themselves. They wanted to buy a house. And the Lord says, not yet. I have the right one for you, but you got ahead of yourself. And you got a house, and it started leaking. It started falling apart. It started doing this, and it started doing that. And you got in a big mess. And then you go to the Lord, Lord, what happened? I prayed about this. And the Lord says, remember I told you, wait. You want to buy a car, and you go up there, and you say, oh, that's a pretty, pretty car. It looked pretty on the outside. And the Lord says, wait, I have something much beautiful for you, something much comfortable for you and your family. Oh, just wait, son. Just wait. But son couldn't wait. He loved the outside of the shape of that car. He says, I better buy it. And the salesperson says, you need to buy it today. It's not going to be here tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You need to buy it right now. It's not going to be here tomorrow. All of a sudden, you fall into that trap. You're not listening to the voice of God. God says, wait, I got something better for you and your family. I love it when he says, you and your family. That means it's going to be a big blessing. It's not going to be a little blessing. Amen. You go and you buy that car. You start riding it around, and it starts giving up on you. It's no longer under warranty. So you got big problems. You got big issues. Why? Because you didn't wait on God's timing. You're looking for a mate. You wait on God's timing on this one. I want to tell you, if you are looking for a mate, you pray, you seek the Lord, you fast, you stay busy in the church. Listen, you stay busy in the church. You keep focused. And then by surprise, he throws you this beautiful nugget. this beautiful nugget and you say I like that nugget Lord <laughs> he takes care of it under his own timing amen, amen. speed is important to Christian runners we need to walk or run this race in God's speed listen when he tells you run do this do that stop don't do wait Listen to the voice of God. The other thing about a runner, a runner will experience injuries. Tell your neighbor injuries. A runner will experience injuries. The hip goes out of place. The knee goes out of place. The ankle, the pulled muscles, the pulled ligaments. Uh, I want to tell you, as uh, Christian runners, we too are going to have uh, traps and obstacles and, and uh, mountains that we have to jump and remove. Uh, there's going to be obstacles in our ways. Uh, there's going to be challenges in our ways. Uh, but it's the attitude. Uh, how are you facing it? How are you coping with it? Uh, are you relying on the Lord? Are you talking to the Lord about it? Are you sharing these incidents with the Lord? A lot of people, especially us Christian runners, we think we're strong enough. We think we're, we're like a frog. 
We want to just load everything in us. Uh, and we don't bring it before the Lord. Uh, have you ever seen the frogs? They, they just breathe really big. Uh, and, and we think we're kangaroos. Uh, also, uh, we want to stuff everything inside. We want to stuff everything inside. And by the time you know, uh, we can't even run anymore. Uh, we're all choked up. Uh, we're all in bad shape. Uh, and then we start getting discouraged. Uh, we, started to, we start hurting ourselves. Uh, we, don't, we can't see the victory. We're in sadness. Uh, and the cloud gets heavier. And the weight gets heavier. And we don't know what to do. Uh, but I want to tell you something. I tell you, this is where we just need to, to just look to Jesus. Uh, Jesus, uh, I need your help. Uh, I'm running this race. Uh, but there's a situation in my life right now that I need you to move it out of the way or take care of it. Uh, Father, or help me jump over it. Uh, oh, the Bible does say we're going to go through the rivers. Uh, we're going to go through the waters. Uh, we're going to go through the fires. Uh, but I want to tell you, like in the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, oh, I want to tell you, the fourth man always comes on the scene. Uh, the fourth man uh, always comes uh, on the scene. Uh, and he sees you through. Uh, the fourth man, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, he comes on the scene. Uh, that's why it's so important to learn really quick. Uh, it's a small church. Learn to call on God real quick uh, in your circumstances, in your daily walk. Uh, learn to talk to God when you see it coming. Uh, start talking to God about those situations. Uh, when it's in front of you, learn to talk to God in those situations. When it comes as a surprise, uh, learn to talk to God about those situations so he can handle it, take care of it, and you can move forward. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. There's something else. Not only do we experience these injuries, a lot of us, we're going to experience disappointments. We're going to experience rejection. We're going to experience hurt. We're going to experience tragedy, death. But he is the healer. He is the counselor. He is your everything in those circumstances of life. Another thing about a runner, a runner has a beautiful mentor, a coach. And the coach encourages the runner, motivates the runner, guides the runner, counsels the runner, corrects the runner, warns the runner, helps the runner in his or her hurts, injuries, wounds. He's there to help you through all that. But there's another thing about the coach. The coach will at times break your spirit to make you a better person. Oh, I want to tell you a lot of times a coach, when he sees that the runner is negative, where the runner is doubting, where the runner says, I don't think I can do this anymore. When the runner wants to give up, there's something about the coach. The coach has to step in and the coach has to break his spirit to make him think again like a winner to make him think uh, like victorious person to have him uh, gain that positive again to walk in faith again to walk in trust again to depend on the Lord like never before oh the, the great coach uh, has to do this to mold us and shape us and build us up for the kingdom of God he's going to do that to you if he hasn't done it, you're going to experience it. Now, let me just tell you that. <laughs> you're going to experience it sooner or later. He's the perfect coach. But when he breaks your spirit, he puts you together in a beautiful way that you come out of that process so strong and powerful. You start thinking like a winner. You start acting like a winner. You start responding like a winner. That's what happens when you have this beautiful coat on your side. Another thing, what Paul was talking about, he says, get rid of all that weight, that heavy weight that entangles you. Why was Paul saying that? Because Paul knew that if we run around with all this unnecessary stuff in our lives that is not godly, 
let me just name a few. <laughs> Jealousy, covetousness, complaining, murmuring, gossip. Do you want me to go on? <laughs> I can stop there. <laughs> All this will choke your spiritual life. That's why Paul said, get rid of all that stuff. You don't need it. If you're coveting your neighbor, shame on you. You should be asking the Lord for the stuff you want. Why covet? Why get all bitter and ugly and, and murmuring against them? Why don't you ask the Lord for those things that you want? Why don't you ask the Lord for those things you desire? I don't understand that. I know as a woman... There's a lot of other women jealous of me. But these are the things I ask the Lord for. Amen. Instead of those women getting upset, why don't they ask of the Lord? Amen. I'm seeking the Lord. I'm telling the Lord, uh, I, want to be, I want to be used by you. I want to be empowered by you. I want to travel for you. The last time I told one of my... Uh, one of my friends, I said, I just have a, I have a strong feeling I'm going to be traveling out of this country quite a bit. <laughs> and she says, you know what? The Lord just spoke to me and said, yeah, you are. But he's going to raise up millionaires to pour into your bosom. <laughs> and it's going to happen really soon. I said, oh, I don't know any millionaires. I don't know about that one. But I'll take the word. <laughs> I took the word, put it in my heart. And I said, Lord... Sister so-and-so, she's your prophetic individual. She said, this is going to happen. If it's your word, let it come to pass. Within a couple of months, I was, my husband and I were invited to Indonesia. And guess what? We didn't have to pay one penny of it. He flies both of us. First, it was going to be my husband. And then I started praying about it. <laughs> it was going to be first my husband. Ladies, here's where the power is. It was just going to be my husband because he travels all the, you know, around the nations. Uh, he travels quite a bit to the Philippines. He's been over there 30 times, and he's getting ready to go. He just came back before, um, right after, or before Christmas. He's getting ready to go again. But they were going to invite him to Indonesia, and I started praying about it, and I said, Lord, uh, um, I want to go too. <laughs> but I had no money to go. <laughs> So anyway, I said, Lord, and I told my husband, I'm going to pray for that brother. He, that brother's going to know that he needs to take me too. <laughs> he needs to sign me up and buy my ticket too. So I got into this uh, praying and fasting mode. Uh, you know, when you do that, God moves. Uh, when you go into that uh, serious mode and that serious nutrition program, uh, God moves. Uh, I want to tell you, so within a couple of weeks, uh, my husband gets this telephone call from Brother um, Paulus, Pastor Paulus, and says, you know what? Uh, my brother just called me up and says that uh, he wants you and your wife to come to Indonesia. And so when my husband told me, I said, oh, God is so wonderful <laughs> because he knows how to take care of us. And when he took us to Indonesia, we ended up going to Bali. Oh, my goodness. We didn't have to pay for anything. I just enjoyed myself. I enjoyed the scenery and then came back. But you know what? Not only that, at that time, I was unemployed. I was in um, education for over 20 years as an assistant superintendent, but due to the cuts and everything, you've, whoever's in education, you know there's constantly cuts. At that time, there was major cuts, and I lost my job. After 20 years, I was like, Lord, what am I going to do? And my unemployment was going to be running out, coming back from uh, Indonesia. The Lord used another millionaire. You know, God is so good. God used another millionaire where we're getting ready. It was the last day for us to come home. But I was going to come home with the situation of no job and no more unemployment. My husband is working, praise the Lord. But it was like, Lord. And I was uh, an individual that was always spoiled. I always had a extra, you know, and I was able to bless a lot of other people. But when, you're on, when you lose your job, you learn to be under what you call a budget. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I had to be under this budget, and um, a tight budget. And so I was going to come home with, uh, with nothing. What am I going to do? So the last day, um, 
Sister June gets a telephone call and says, is Pastor Lemons and Sister Martha still there? And she said, yes, but we're getting ready to go to the airport. He says, wait, I'm going to send my driver. My driver has a gift for them. So anyway, so at that time, we waited, we waited. We were getting a little nervous. The time is moving really fast. Uh, and so anyway, um, the driver gets there with this envelope. And so anyway, so it had Pastor Lim and Sister Martha on there. Thank God it had my name on there. So anyway, so anyway, he says, you open it. And I said, no, you open it. He says, no, you open it. And I said, you open it. And then so he says, you open it. I said, okay, I'll open it. So anyway, so I got the envelope, opened it. There was another envelope in there. And that little other envelope was pretty thick. I said, here, you open it. He says, no, you open it. And so I said, okay, I'll open it. When I opened that envelope, there was nothing but hundreds of dollars in there, hundreds. So it was enough to pay for, for my husband to get his car fixed, for my husband to get his tooth fixed for the couple of months. It was like three months of, uh, to make up for what I was not going to be uh, working. And the Lord, within that time when I came back, I had to apply for a job. And they called me and they said, would you come for an interview? Went to an interview. I went to a second interview. And they hired me. And ever since then, I've been there. But I want to tell you, it is... When you stick to that nutrition program of prayer, fasting, reading, and soaking in the Lord, you move the hand of God. Amen. 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 It's important to focus on the Lord, and I want to close with this. There was two men. The Bible says, focus on the Lord to finish the race. It says in Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We need to focus on the Lord. The purpose of running, we're not running alone. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the best coach, the best mentor. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. Once you accept that the Lord is your personal Savior, he lives in you. You mean this wonderful, beautiful, precious Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that caused such a commotion, and rose him from the dead, is the same Holy Spirit that dwells in you and in me? You got it. He is so powerful. He lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit abides in you. The Holy Spirit is full of wisdom. When I need wisdom, I just say, Holy Spirit, you're full of wisdom. And what do I do here? The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom because he is wisdom. The Holy Spirit will give you understanding because he is understanding. The Holy Spirit will counsel you because he's the great counselor. He's the great counselor. You want some counsel? Talk to the Holy Spirit and he will give you what you need. He's the great counselor. There's many times as a pastor's wife, I need the counsel of God. I need the wisdom of God because I'm constantly counseling, helping, encouraging, blessing our youth. I want our youth to be the best. I want the youth to be great leaders, powerful leaders. I'm their little, you know, spiritual mama. You can do it. You can do it. I'm praying for them. Now they have, many of them have good jobs. It's because someone was pushing them. I want to tell you the Holy Spirit spirit lives in you not only is he wonderful but he's also the anointed one you want power you start talking to the holy spirit the holy spirit is my true friend the holy spirit is my counselor the holy spirit is my partner when i go and minister somewhere i tell the holy spirit let's go holy spirit because the holy spirit knows the people before i get there the holy spirit knows the consequence the holy spirit knows the atmosphere. The Holy Spirit will let me know ahead of time uh, what I'm going to be facing. Uh, the Holy Spirit prepares me when uh, I go into an unknown territory. There's something about the Holy Spirit. Uh, you need power in your daily walk. Uh, start talking to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, uh, I need to be empowered today. Holy Spirit, I need you. Not only that, uh, but the Holy Spirit convicts us. Uh, he convicts us of all things that are not godly. He convicts convicts you. He goes into your heart, into your spirit, into your mind. And he says, this is not good. He puts that red flag. He puts that red, the, the red light. And he says, no, 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 no. That is danger. Get away from that. Stay away from that. Don't partake from that. He's a great counselor. 
And another thing about that, he will warn you as you are talking to people. One day I was talking to a woman, and I thought, oh, she's my friend. I think I'm going to like this relationship. I'm going to like being with her. I'm going to like talking with her. The Holy Spirit spoke to me so loud and clear in my heart. He said, she's not your friend. And I'm going, mm, mm, mm. I thought I heard something. <laughs> and I thought, God, she's so sweet. She's so nice, thinking within myself as we're talking. The Holy Spirit, again, as we're talking, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, she's not your friend. That was the second time. You know, sometimes <laughs> the coach never gives up on us. Thank God. Say, thank God. <laughs> sometimes we're slow learners. Uh, you know, sometimes we're real quick to learn. Sometimes we're just like Peter. Sometimes we're just fast. Sometimes we're real slow. The Holy Spirit, the third time as we were talking, he made it very clear. He even said my name. Usually he says daughter. <laughs> Sometimes when he wants to get your attention, he'll use your first name. Have you noticed that? <laughs> he says, Martha, she's not your friend. Two days later, she was not my friend. Two days later, she was not my friend. That's how wonderful walking with the Holy Spirit is. Even to tell you, she is not your friend. What a what a beautiful Holy Spirit. What a beautiful coach and counsel to do that. That was free, okay? The next one is focus on the Lord. Focus on the Lord. There was two men, and I will end with this, and I promise. There was two men that I just, one was in the Old Testament. His name was King David. King David loved the Lord. King David had a heart after God. King David was just so an example for many other kings. King David was so wealthy, so, so blessed. He loved God. He even danced before God. He, I mean, he would pray. He would fast. He would do everything to gain the honor of God, to gain the favor of God. And he was well-respected. But one day, David woke up from a nap, and you know the story. He goes out walking around, and he sees this beautiful woman bathing. He could have said, like we do nowadays, because everybody wants to show and tell everything nowadays, say yes. You know what I'm talking about. You live in America. <laughs> Sometimes I'm in church, and they're going, hmm, I never see that. And I'm going, oh, my. So anyway, we live in America, and the culture has changed. The generation has changed. Everybody wants to show and tell everything, you know? So David saw this beautiful woman bathing, he could have said, oops, and walked on, like we do nowadays. Oops. You know, somebody's right in front of you going, oops, <laughs> and you move on. You have to. You have no business staring. That gets you in trouble. On the computer, if something pops up, you get it out of there. <laughs> you have no business staring into something that is not godly. Hearing things, you have no business hearing garbage that's going to pollute and um, damage your spiritual life. Get rid of it. Turn it off. Turn off the TV if you have to. Turn off the radio if you have to. Turn off the computer if you have to. Don't get entangled in that thing because it will draw you into a pit. David, King David, he could have said, oops, and moved on, but he stared and then he requested for Bathsheba to come. They slept together. She got pregnant. David is in a mess now. He's in a big mess, doesn't know what to do. So he decides, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and have um, Uriah killed. He set this plan up, and it worked. And then he got himself in a bigger mess that God had to send a prophet. He could have just said, oops, and moved on. But he didn't. When we get, lose our focus from running the race, we get ourselves in a pit as well. But you know what? When that happens and you know you're in a pit, get out of it quickly. God was so merciful to David that he sent a prophet and he said a story, a parable. There was a rich man that had many sheep. There was a poor man that had one little sheep. Remember that? And the rich man took the little lamb from the poor man, and he says, kill him. 
And do you remember the prophet said, that was you. That's you. And do you remember he went into a fast for many days? Do you remember he wept and cried before the Lord? Do you remember that? But he came back running the race again. There's a lot of Christians that are wounded. They are wounded. They need to get back up. You serve a forgiving God. He's the one that heals you, restores you, and gets you back running again. There was another man in the New Testament. His name was Peter. Peter, they were in the boat, the disciples. Remember that? And Jesus was walking on water. And um, Jesus, you know, was just real cool walking and just having a great time walking on the water. And the disciples are scared. They're saying, oh, my goodness, that's a ghost. And Jesus says, be calm. It's me. And then Peter, well, brave, says, well, bid me to go out there. Do you remember that? And so Peter got out of the boat, started walking. As long as he had his eyes on the Lord, he was able to do the impossible. I want you to hear this, church. As long as you have your eyes on the Lord, you will do the impossible. You will do the impossible. You will do the impossible. Where people thought, how is she doing that? How is he doing that? How is he getting blessed? How is he getting promoted? How is he being the head and not the tail? How is he being the above and not the beneath? Because your eyes are focused on the Lord. And as his eyes were focused on the Lord, he was able to do the impossible. But when his eyes got off the Lord, he started to sink. This is what happens to us. When we lose sight of the Lord Jesus Christ, we begin to sink. Why don't we stand? 